Network address translation, or NAT, allows many private IP addresses to share a single public IP address. It also hides these addresses from those who access the public IP. Traffic through the public IP address is filtered by a firewall, protecting the private IPs. Requests for a host from the private IPs pass through the server to the public IP and internet. The server stores the source and destination IPs and MAC addresses in a special database known as its NAT table, so that it can reroute traffic back to the original destination on the private network. As far as the public network is concerned, it is dealing only with the NAT server. Therefore, NAT acts as both a router and a security device. NAT is different from a proxy server in that it does not disassemble and reassemble each packet as it passes through. As a disadvantage, it therefore does not protect the network against malformed packets or acts and flag attacks as a proxy server would. As an advantage, it possesses faster throughput than a proxy server, again, simply because it doesn't have to disassemble and reassemble every packet going through it. Let's examine our network's preliminary configuration before installing NAT. We're going to be looking at routing and remote access today. And I'm on a, a 2008 domain controller, host named Galactica. And it's a multi-home computer. It's got two network interfaces. Let me show you how they look. I have one that's a dynamic IP. Okay, and you can see it's leafing an IP address dynamically. And it's acting as the gateway, configured thus by the DHCP server. I have a second interface that has a static IP address. And this static IP address, um, it routes to a private local area network. Okay. And it's also the, you know, that's the same interface that DNS is serving out. So it's multi-homed, more than one NIC card. And we're going to implement some routing. Um, let me close this down. And let me open up a command prompt. And just so we start with a clean slate, let me uh, give ourselves some room here a bit. I want to start with a clean slate here. Let me recurse out. So we'll flush the resolver cache and let's go ahead and dump the art cache too. And Just to show you, so there's nothing in the cache now. It's clean as a whistle. And let me go ahead and display the routing table. Okay. If you take a gander at it, notice that anything that's not on our local area network, our private network, which down here is 220.110, it's going to be sent out the default gateway, which has been configured as such by the DHCP server. And it'll go out this interface. So this is the dynamic IP we leased from the DHCP server on that interface. So when it, you know, if I ping Yahoo or I ping somebody on the internet, this packet, those datagrams will be routed and sent out this interface of this IP. That's the second interface that I showed you. The first interface I showed you, um, the private one, has a static IP and um, it's 220.111. And so anything on that whole network, notice this is a network address for the Class C network 220.110. It's going to be sent out 220.111. Okay, so. And let's just test that out. So let's go up here and we'll ping Starbuck, who's on the private network. And get our four echo replies. And let's go out and let's send a packet or two out on the internet. So we'll ping, um, let's ping Google. Okay, and again, so now it's passing out our default gateway at the other NIC or interface card. And go into Google. And again, just looking at the default routes, those last two packets we sent went out 1992071314 to find the gateway 1992071311. And from there, um, you know, to dynamic DNS on the router, to my internet service provider, and then on, onto the internet. Now the packets. The datagrams going to Starbuck took this route, 220.110, and they took the interface 220.111. Okay, so let's hop on over. I mean, yeah, I can since this is multi-homed and has more than one interface, I can reach the internet from this computer, even though I on one interface I have a private static IP. Let's take a let's hop on over to um, uh, the Windows 7 machine and look at look at it from Starbuck's point of view. We'll verify that without NAT, packets can't leave the local subnet. 
on our Windows 7 uh, workstation, our client. And again, let's let's take a look at the IP settings here. Um, I'll make this a little bit easier for you to read, I hope. I'm going to curse out here. Okay. And And then again, notice the IP settings here. So I'm 221.110. Of course, I have a DNS record uh, on the server to that effect as well. But um, notice I can ping local addresses. So if I ping Galactica, I get four echo replies. Um, however, I should have pinged somebody like Google. Notice that I don't have a default route for those packets to travel. Now, in this example, I am using Galactica as, you know, that its IP is my default gateway on this workstation. But until I actually set up routing and remote access, I'm just trying to show you what that looks like or what happens. And if you look here, anything that, you know, Basically, anything that, you know, any packet that's not on my local network that I'm going to send if I get the internet, it's going to get routed to 220.111. Okay, out interface 220.1.10. So it's actually getting to Galactica, but Galactica doesn't know what to do with it at this point. And so now we need to go ahead and set up routing to start, you know, basically to start routing packets and, and datagrams back and forth from one subnetter network to another. Let's set up the NAT server now. To implement routing, the first thing we need to do is install the routing and remote access server role. Of course, we go to server manager, we click add roles, go to server roles, and then the routing and remote access roles are actually tucked in, uh, you know, into these roles here. And I can go back and look at, if I, if I further select these roles, I want a network policy server, which I'll end up using, and we'll have network policies. and. I want routing and remote access services. That's the primary routing service that we'll be using. So I want to check all these options here. I'm going to click Next and Install. And then, and installation succeeded. And go ahead and close Server Manager. And in my usual MO, I'm going to add another icon to my icon form. And let me do routing and remote access. Okay. And the first kind of routing we're going to implement is NAT or network address translation. And basically what that does is it, it'll take a single public IP and share it out among multiple private IPs. I'm just going to do custom configuration for now. And just a scaled down version here, just, you know, simple NAT. I'm going to say next and go ahead and install network address translation. Notice this is routing and remote access has created a default connection request policy called Microsoft Routing and Remote Access Service Policy. And um, to ensure that this new policy is not conflict with existing network policy server connection, it doesn't because I haven't installed it yet. It's the first time I just, but it's just warning you in case your organization, your organization or your company had you know, a radius policy or a network policy server in place and you want to make sure that the default policy doesn't violate whatever policies you might have in place. If you're just setting routing and remote access up for the first time, I guess, you know, that's not a worry. So we'll click on OK. I'm going to start routing and remote access. And I'm not going to do IP version 6 today. We're just going to, you know, be dealing with IP version 4. So I'm going to go ahead and open, kind of inflate this. Uh, i center it there. I hope that, hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm doing. Okay, so notice once I configure it, here's my two basic interfaces. Here's my static interface. Um, you know, so that's my local area network, my private network. 221.1.1. And then here's my dynamic IP that I've leased from a DHCP server, and that goes out to the internet. 
1092071314. So I have those two there. And under static routes, here's my routing table. Just remember when I typed route print at the command prompt? So here's pretty much a you know a graphical window version of that same thing. Just showing my routes for my local you know private network and out to the public for my public network. And I haven't added any static route yet. And then um, you know IGMP and then NAT right here. So the next thing I want to do now that I've set up you know NAT and I've configured routing and remote access, I need to add my interfaces. So I'm going to say new interface. And I need to add them both, but you have to be careful, you know, which one you tell NAT is, is public versus which one you say is private. And the reason is it's going to implement, uh, you know, security measures and a firewall on the public address for, you know, for security precaution. So you want to make sure you tell it the right one. And I'm going to do my dynamic IP, which is my public. And so I'm going to check public and enable NAT on this interface. Okay. And then I'm going to say, okay. And then I need to add my next interface. And I'm going to do my local static IP, and it's private. Okay. And so the network address translation table, or the NAT table, will then keep track and packets and datagrams that, you know, I, I could have 10, 15 computers on, you know, internally on my network or more, uh, and they will all be sending traffic through the NAT server out onto the internet. But as far as machines on the internet are concerned, they're, they're only dealing with one IP address. And that's this address here, um, 192.0.7.13.14. Now, you know, I may have a dozen computers on the private side of my network, but they're all sharing this one IP. And what NAT does is it sort of takes the packet, strips it down, you know, the, the source and destination fields, and superimposes its own IP address. But it remembers the MAC address, you know, where where this where the packet came from, the, the datagram came from, and so. Um, well, all right. Let's let's look at it this way. Let's let's say that you know I'm computer A, and I'm behind the NAT server, and I'm on a you know private network. And I, I want to contact uh, Google.com. So I craft a packet and I send the packet out, and it has you know the source IP and the source MAC address are computer A. The destination IP is Google. It gets to the NAT server, and the NAT server says, "Okay, I see where this packet came from. This packet came from computer A." I know the MAC address and there's the IP of computer A. So what it does is it keeps it stores that data in its NAT table and then it strips the field data out of the datagram and basically inserts, you know, its as far as the, the source value, its IP address, its MAC address. And then it takes that packet of that datagram and it sends it out through its public interface onto the internet and it finds Google. As far as Google's concerned, it's just communicating with the NAT server. So when Google wants to send a reply packet back, it formats it with the you know the two field the two IP and the two MAC address are addressed to the NAT server. That packet comes back to the NAT server and the NAT server realizes from the session and the flags and the source and destination uh, field data in the datagram that that's the packet that computer A was requesting on its private network. And so what it does is it again just kind of disassembles and reassembles the packet or the datagram a little bit and puts the you know, the destination IP address and MAC address for A back into the packet and then sends it on its way. So it kind of acts as a middleman between the public and, and private network. So with NAT set up, let's see how this works now. And again, if I were to test it here, you know, obviously I can ping on the server itself because I have a direct connection to the internet. So I'm not really needing NAT or I'm not really implementing NAT here. The true test of NAT will be when we hop on over to Starbucks, which is the host that is only connected by the private network. And if network address translation is working, now, you know, whereas before I could not get out on the internet, now I should be able to. So let's hop on over and check it. Now that the NAT server is set up, let's see if we can route packets off the local subnet. We're back on our Windows 7 client now, our workstation, and let's test it now. Let's see if network address translation can route our packets. Of course, we can ping Galactica. That's on our local area network, our private network. But is NAT able to route packets properly if we try to ping, say, Yahoo? And there you go. So network address translation, you know, any computer behind the firewall, behind my NAT server on my private network can now all access the internet through that single IP address, that one public IP.
via a network address translation.